Well, good morning, everybody. Good to be able to share with you this morning. It's nice that it comes back. Um, <clears throat> we've been uh, having a look at a, a series of sermons on one particular theme, and it has been this hindrances to holiness. We talk about walking in holiness. And uh, we said that there's a number of things that can, you know, when you read that in the, the scriptures, if you read something like Romans chapter 6 or, or 1 John, uh, we look at that and think, wow, this is like amazing. You know, the, the, the Christian life that is described there is just an incredible life. But then we look at our own life and maybe we start to think, hang on, why, why, why am I not living like this then? How come... You know, it sounds great, but it doesn't sound a lot like my experience. And some of the reason can be because there's certain hindrances to holiness, hindrances to walking in obedience to Christ. And we've been looking at what those hindrances are. I don't know if you, you recall, but the first one we looked at was simply unbelief. That can hinder your walk of, of obedience to Christ. And we talked about how unbelief can sometimes be not just, just a lack of faith, but really, uh, uh, a lack of a lack of uh, yielding to the truth of what God is saying in His Word, it can become just just basically disobedience to God's Word, His testimony, a refusal to accept it, uh, and we can call that unbelief. But but that when God has said it, we ought to accept it. You know, because I often have this conversation with people who say, "Oh, it must be great being a Christian." Just you know that kind of that leap in the dark. And so it's not a leap in the dark; it's a response to what God has said. You know, as uh, uh, Dr. Uh, E.F. Hills used to talk about, the logic of faith. And there's a logic to it. It's not just a leap in the dark. And so we talked about that, that how unbelief can hinder uh, our, our walk of holiness with the Lord. And then, and then the second thing that we looked at was uh, secret sins. Uh, now, again, just to clarify, I'm not talking about people who struggle with a besetting sin and uh, it's a real problem to them and it, and it, and it causes them to mourn and, and so on. You know, I have every sympathy with people who are in that position. And sometimes sin can be a bit like that. You can wrestle with it and struggle with it. And you need, uh, uh, you know, the fellowship of, of, of believers to help you in that. And uh, uh, so I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is people who make a little place in their life for, for a particular sin or sins. Just what, what uh, J.D. Drysdale used to call uh, their darling sin, their thing. And we gave the example of, uh, of Achan in the Old Testament, how he took uh, the Babylonish garment and a little bit of silver, a little bit of gold, and he made a hole in the ground under his tent, and he hid it away there but it brought the judgment of God upon the children of Israel. So he's saying, you need to, to get that out of your life. You know, remove that secret sin, and, and, and it will remove that hindrance to holiness. So continuing along those themes, along that idea this morning, uh, what I want to look at today is something, maybe sounds a bit surprising, and you might not even think of this as a hindrance to holiness, but it is simply looking back looking back anyone recognize that guy by the way they're on it yes Nathaniel? Eric. eric little yes yes looking back and you see there the, the, eric little who for those who don't know was a christian he was a, an olympic athlete and uh, his his claim to fame was that he, he wouldn't run on a sunday he wouldn't run on the sabbath he said no i'm, I'm a christian and it caused absolute uproar. You can imagine the Olympic Games, he was a British hopeful, and uh, he said, no, I, I'm not gonna do that because God comes first. And there, there were questions in Parliament, it was a big, huge, huge issue. But we're gonna be looking today at uh, uh, looking back, we're gonna use a metaphor, really, that the Bible uses of a race, the Christian life, sometimes called a walk, it is also called by the Apostle Paul a race. I'm going to be looking at that, that idea of you know, you're looking ahead to the finishing line, to, to where that, that, that line you're going to cross. And you're, you know, I tell my children, don't walk in one direction and look in the other. Have you ever seen a child doing that? And they'll walk on, they're looking like, walking that way, looking that way. So before you know, they've walked into something. You know, you, you, you're going to walk into an obstacle if you do that. 
you need to be looking where you're walking. Okay, so having said all that, let's turn to the scriptures. Philippians chapter 3 is where we're going. Philippians 3. I'll just put it up here. Philippians 3, verse 13 and 14. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Amazing. All, all the things that Paul had achieved in his life, all those amazing victories and the blessings that, that Paul had seen in his life, and yet in effect he is saying, well, yeah, that was then, but this is now. Yeah, I'm not going to lean on those victories. I'm not going to dwell on all those victories. I'm going to give God the glory for it. But I'm going to spend my life looking back. What about now? And what about what I'm looking forward to in the future? Now there are many ways in which Christians should not look back. Uh, one of those things would be uh, uh, we must forget past sins. Those things that are already under the blood. Those things that we did that we're ashamed of. If God has forgiven you, if you've repented of that and you've let, leave it there, don't keep dragging it out again and looking at it. If God has forgiven it, then trust in Him. Let the blood cover it. Don't keep trying to pull it out. Now, it's not the context which Paul's talking here in Philippians, but I think it's important to say, you know, past sins are under the blood. That's why Jesus died. Secondly, if we are to stretch forward, if we're to look ahead, we are to forget past disappointments. You know, maybe, maybe you've, in your life, there have been, particularly if you've been a Christian a long time, maybe there are other Christians you feel have let you down. You know, maybe you, you, you had a, a Christian friend or you, you, you put your trust in somebody and they failed you and then let you down and disappointment comes in and regret and hurt. You know, I mean, I, I've been in churches that have folded, that have just, you know, that's it, that's the end of the church, everybody good, goodbye. You know, and you feel that pain uh, and that disappointment. You know, I've been in church, churches where, where the, the, the minister has, has basically been fired, you know, because of, because of disgraceful conduct. And that's hard for a congregation to, to deal with that. That hurts, you know. But that's in the past. You know, you've got to lay and leave those disappointments behind. Don't let them haunt you for the rest of your Christian walk. It's time to just say, that was then, this is now. Okay? I am going to forget those things which are behind. And I'm going to reach forth onto those things which are before. Just turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians 9. Verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. Everybody's running. Everybody's taking part in the race. Yet only one will be the winner. Therefore run your race as one that means to win. Is Paul talking about work salvation? No. He believes in salvation by grace. But he's saying, look, 
This Christian life involves certain elements that are indispensable. Discipline. Uh, uh, the desire to, to, to win. The desire to, to take hold of that prize which God uh, has put before you. The Bible talks about there are crowns that we can have. You know, I want as many crowns as possible. I want to throw a whole load of crowns at the feet of Jesus when I get to heaven. You know, the, 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 a race takes effort, doesn't it? It takes training. Now, there, there are some Christians whose concept of grace, you know, these verses we're looking at this morning have, have no meaning whatsoever to them. They have no meaning. They think grace is just some kind of mystical word. They just pull out of the air uh, when, when, when your sin has been exposed. Oh, I'm about grace. Well, Paul's saying, look, you know, that's not all uh, that grace is about. You know, when, when somebody, somebody goes into uh, uh, training uh, for a race like the Olympics, they, they are, as it says in, in, in verse 25, uh, they are temperate in all things. That means they are self controlled you know they, they they deny themselves certain foods they deny themselves certain drink they go to bed early they get up early you know their training takes over their life doesn't it you know i had a friend who used to work with a guy who was a bodybuilder huge guy right and he, he had a friend who used to go in for all these competitions and so on and sometimes he would come in have a chat with us and uh, you know <coughs> The sort of where I worked, a sort of shop, people would bring things in like like trays of cakes and that sort of thing. It was a nice place to work. And, and they'd bring this stuff in. And, and, and if this guy was there, they'd say, would, would you like some? And he said, oh, no, I'm, I'm in training. So I'm in training for a competition. I can't have that. That's no good for me. And it's the same. You know, as a Christian, you need to be of the mindset. I'm in training. I'm in training. I, I've got a prize to win. I've got a race to run. Therefore, you bring something that's no good. I'm going to say, no, that's no good for me. Might be alright for you because you're not in training. Might be okay for you to indulge in those things, but it's not okay for me because I'm in training because I've got a prize that I want to win. I'm in a race. You know, I'm getting ready for that race. Who's going to win the race? The one who's been doing the training? Or imagine if you, uh, I don't know if you've ever watched the Olympics or, you know, seen it uh, 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 in the past but when they when they all line up for the hundred meters or something like that and you get the top athletes from around the world don't you every single country is desperate to put their, their top athlete their best guy in there or their best woman in there and uh, and, and they all line up and, and it goes along along the line doesn't it, it says and here he is from well, you know, from from France and here is so and so from the USA and and, and you get the name of the country, the person, and you look and you think, wow, yeah, he looks like he could really run fast. You know, they're kind of trim and they're muscular. You can tell that they've been training, they've been working hard at it. They've devoted a lot of their time to that. You know, they've denied themselves certain things to be in that peak physical state. Well, imagine if the camera panned along and then there's somebody at the end there and they're sort of, you know, the bellies hanging over the shorts. And uh, you know, a cheeseburger in this hand, a cigarette in the other hand, and uh, and he and he turns to the all the athletes and he says, oh, "I used to be pretty good at this. So I think I'll do it." Do you think he's got much of a chance? Is he going to win? Is he going to sail past them all straight through the the finishing line? Yeah. No, he's going to make a fool of himself, isn't he? But you know, that's what some Christians are like. They're looking back. Or 20 years ago, do you know what I did? I, had to, you know, I used to preach and I used to do this and I used to do What about now? Are you, are you in training now? What, what sort of spiritual shape are you in today? You know, it's no good looking back and, and, and leaning on those past victories and saying, but why aren't I walking in holiness? Why am I struggling? Well, are you in training? Are you studying? Are you studying like a workman? Yeah? <laughs> Rightly dividing the word of God? Are you studying to show yourself approved? Sadly, many are not. Paul says, I therefore so run, 
not as uncer uncertainly. There's a certainty about Paul's race. So I'm, not, I'm not running like somebody who doesn't know where they're going. I've got my eye on the line. I know where I'm going. I know where I'm heading. I'm not, I'm not you know, running out of this lane and that lane or where do I go now. So I know where I'm going. I can, my, eye, my eye is on the line. My eye is on the prize. That's what Christians today have to do. They need to set their eye on the prize. We need to set our eye on the prize. What do you need to be uh, a good runner? What do you need to be a healthy Christian who's walking according to holiness? Well, first of all, you need the right attitude. It starts in the mind, doesn't it? Often with these runners who are successful, it starts, it, 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 it's about their physical condition, but it's also mental. It's about a mental determination um, of, I'm going to cross that finishing line first. Let's just turn to Hebrews 6 for a moment. Bring in a few more scriptures now. Hebrews 6. Verse 1 says this. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So the sense in which the writer of Hebrews is saying, look, you know, let's move on from those first things that you learned from repentance from dead works. In other words, from repentance from open sins. Yeah, we, we, you understood that. All right, let's move on. Let's move on. From, from faith in God. Now that doesn't mean he abandons faith in God. Alright, oh, I'm done now, I won't bother doing that again. But what it means is like, it should be established in your Christian life at this time. You understand that you turn away from sin and that, that you're living by faith in God. But it's time now to learn more. Let us go on unto perfection. Let's go on to the deeper Christian life. That we might follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Hebrews 12, 14. This is what grace is for. You see, grace has not only forgiven, but it has given forth. What does grace give? It has given all things that pertain unto life and godliness, Peter says. 2 Peter 1 verse 3. Grace gives us all things, but it is faith that receives all that grace has given us. Grace has prepared you to be fully equipped for this race that you are in. The Christian life is a race. And you are taking part in that race and you have to take your training seriously <coughs> if you are going to win the race. Somebody once said, don't play at being a Christian because Satan doesn't play at being the devil. Yeah, that's a good quote. It's a good saying. Take it seriously. You're involved in a very serious conflict and a serious race. Therefore, take it seriously. Deny yourself those things that are necessary. Uh, uh, do that training which is necessary in order to win that race. Don't be distracted by people who are not involved in the race, you know, but rather be single-minded about these things. That takes something else. It takes what we call fortitude. What's fortitude? Fortitude is, is uh, if you like, courage, mental emotional uh, strength. The Bible says watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. There's, there's, you know, particularly for men I think today, for Christian men, there needs to be a reclaiming of what it means to really be a man. You know, that this is eroded in our society. To be a strong Christian man. William Booth used to talk about fighting manfully. 
you know, as a Christian, standing up, being a man, taking that responsibility. Uh, uh, you know, don't be, don't be a spiritual sissy. You know, be a man. Stand up, take on the responsibility. Study. You know, I find it hard to study. I'm not, I'm not a gifted academic. I'm not, you know, a, a scholarly person. I do particularly well at school. It's hard for me, but I have to study. I have to set that time aside. You know, it comes a certain time of the night, and, and whatever work I'm doing, you know, the laptop goes off and everything, and I come upstairs, just me, and this old King James Bible, and I sit down, and I just read it, and I study it. Because it's important, you know, I have to set my mind to these things. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9 uh, uh, uses the word effeminate, and it uses it in the same list as fornicators, idolaters, and adulterers. Now, we think of effeminate, maybe you think of you know, someone being a female, or is that like a man being... What it really means is, is soft, the original word, it means soft, or a, a, a lover of kind of luxurious things. You can't endure anything that's, that's too, too hard or too, too, too difficult. The idea was that, you know, uh, uh, women uh, in those days were, you know, they had soft hands and, and look after a woman and, and would you like to sit down and, you know, don't, I'll do that. You, that's the sort of idea behind it. And, it's, and the picture is that there are men growing up who are like that. They're, they're big softies. They can't do anything. You know, they can't do anything that's hard or difficult. Someone's got to come along and help them. Uh, and so really at the heart of it, that's what the word effeminate is mean, a lover of softness. You know, and Christian men, come on, it's time to stand up. It's time to say, I'll take the strain of this Christian life. You know, I'll be a man and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll lead my family. I will, I will lead those who are younger than me. You know, I'll take on that responsibility. Really important in this day and age. And Paul uses another uh, uh, metaphor, if you like. Uh, he talks about the fight of faith. Fight the good fight. And Paul says I, that, that he fights not as one that beateth the air. The picture is of a boxer and he comes out and if you've ever done a bit of boxing or anything like that or any sort of contact sport, when you punch, if you punch and you miss the person, uh, it takes a lot of effort out of you. You know, you, if you swing and you're missing the person, every time you swing, imagine you put all your strength and all your effort into that, and it just sails past the person, it doesn't, doesn't even hit them. <clears throat> that, that's exhausting. It's absolutely exhausting. <coughs> what the idea for this is, is, is bringing is, I'm not like one swinging wildly. He said, I've done my training. I've done my studying. I've done my training. So I know, therefore, exactly where to hit my opponent. I'm not going to spend any energy or wasting time. If you study, and you study the scriptures, and you come and witness to somebody about the Lord Jesus Christ, you should be like a boxer. You should know exactly where to, what verse to use and where to put it with that person. You know, that's part of the training. It doesn't just come naturally. You know, some people are, uh, are, I guess, better than others at it, and some people do it earlier in their Christian life, but it comes with studying the Word of God. The more you study, the more you train, the more you do it, the more, the, the more exact you'll be with it. The more professional, if you like, you'll be. You'll know it. You'll be like a professional boxer who knows just when to wait and when to move in with the Gospel. And, and, and that's what, what it's, it's having that courage to do it and having uh, that, that mental and emotional strength that you're not going to crack up when things get difficult, when circumstances get heavy and you can, you can go through it. Now I might, I'm not saying well, it won't be hard, it won't be difficult. I'm not saying when, when difficulties come to you, you're not going to feel anything, you're not going to feel hurt or upset, but your, your discipline and your training will take you through it as a Christian. Prayer, study, fellowship. These are the means of grace that God has given us in order that we can become strong Christian men and women. 
in order that when you come to these difficult situations, you'll go through them. When you come to that fiery trial, God will be bringing forth your faith as gold. But you have to be in training. You, you need to have a disciplined and orderly training regime. If you're an athlete, if you're running a race, you've got to have order, you've got to have discipline in your life. It's the same with being a Christian. I'm afraid it, some people find that easier than others, but, but that's how it is. You've got to have a disciplined, orderly life. Take something else as well. Solitude. Now, we talk a lot about the importance of Christian fellowship, being with other Christians, having them help you and build you up and all the rest of it. And that's good. But there are times where you've got to be on your own with the Lord. There are times where you need to retire, you need to go away and just be with God. The Lord Jesus did it. If it's necessary for Jesus, then it's necessary for us, isn't it? Yeah? Prayer. Prayer. There's a hymn that says, in seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief and oft escaped the tempter's snare by thy return, sweet hour of prayer. You all heard that? that. It's a beautiful hymn. It really is. It's talking about getting alone with the Lord. What I call uh, laying out your table before God. So the idea is that, that, that you, you get alone with God you lay out before God everything that's troubling you, everything that you're struggling with in your life. You lay out your, your hopes, your, your dreams, what you want to achieve. And you just sit there with it all before God and you talk to Him about it. You, know? and you say, Lord, th 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 this, is, this is what hurts me. This is what I struggle with. This is what I want in you. And so on. Without that, you're not going to make that walk of holiness. There's no way. There's no way you are going to walk in obedience to Christ if you're not setting some time aside to be with God, just you and Him. When you talk to people who've become Christians, who've been born again by the Spirit of God, often, often you find that they were praying. They were seeking the Lord. They were on their own. Now, there have been other things in there as well. You know, they've heard a message preached or they know somebody who's witnessed to them and so on. But often it's in the times when they're on their own. That's when they encounter really the power of God and the salvation of God. And that ought not to stop in the Christian life. You know, if you're seeking that power, you need that, that strength to go through and to live that, that life and to walk that walk. Then of course you're going to need to be with God. Of course you're going to need to come away from everything else and just be alone with the Lord. I would really encourage you to do that uh, uh, when you get time. I know it's hard sometimes. Busy lives, noisy houses. Uh, don't get much noise in our house at times, but uh, you can, you can, you know, if that's the case, go, go for a, for a walk, go out for a walk, go for a cycle. Uh, I used to occasionally go up to Edale, right up on top of the hills there, just walk out, you know, and just pray to God. It's brilliant. It's just amazing, you know. Just set aside that sweet hour of prayer just to be with the Lord. The Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Just stop there for a moment. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. What's going to happen to those who don't wait upon the Lord? They're not going to renew their strength, are they? It's kind of logical, really. You need to wait upon the Lord in order to renew your strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. If you want to win that prize, if you want to cross that finishing line, if you want to run and not be weary, then you need to be with your Father. You need to be, be alone with God. Set some time aside and lay out your table before Him. If Jesus did it, then you should do it. You're not greater than your Master. He had to do it. And, and go up on a mountain and be with God, then so do we. So I want to encourage you, if 
you want to overcome those hindrances to holiness, then you need to do that. You need to stop looking back on past victories. Stop looking back and thinking, well, I did this and I did that. I should really be doing well now. Well, well hang on. Where are you today? You know, the Bible says, uh, deny yourself, take up your cross yearly, monthly, weekly, daily, <laughs> daily. Take up your cross daily. Every morning it starts again. Okay, you can't look back and say, well, yesterday was a brilliant day. The Lord bless me so much. Good. Please about that. But what about today? Where are you today? Walking according to the flesh or walking according to the spirit? Now, only by his grace, only by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit can we do it. Well, let's avail ourselves of the means of grace. Let's avail ourselves to study, uh, uh, to have fellowship, to pray, so that God can use these things to build us up, to edify us, so that we're ready for that race. Don't want to be the fat guy with his belly hanging over the, the shorts and hoping to make it. I, I want, I, that's no good. We need to be trained. We need to be disciplined in the things of God. Make it a priority in your life uh, that you might walk in holiness. Let's pray.